Um, thank you very much, Professor Fasius, for such a kind introduction. And um, I really like to thank uh, the Tokyo College and the director, Professor Haneda, as well as Deputy Director, Professor Mino, for extending this very kind invitation to me to speak today. And I'm going to be um, speaking in English, um, but I'll be happy to take questions in English or Japanese later on. Um, so I'm going to um, be speaking about something that I've been working for the past decade, uh, which is trying to figure out how one can have or develop cultural approaches to studying global diplomacy. And my own work has focused on developing a conceptual uh, framework, which I call diplomacy as theater, through a historical study of the Bandung Conference of 1955. Collecti collectively, I have initiated a number of interdisciplinary projects with close research collaborators, uh, one involving the use of visual sources in studying global diplomacy with Dr. Matthew Phillips, um, who is actually a specialist of Southeast Asia. And he was an academic, but he's now gone to work for the British Foreign Office. So I, it's actually been very interesting seeing this transition of a scholar academic to becoming a di scholar diplomat. And another on this um, aforementioned Oxford University handbook on the cultural history of global diplomacy that Professor Fascius has kindly mentioned. And this I'm doing with uh, Dr. Christian Gershel, who's a historian of modern Europe. And um, it involves about 30 contributors um, in all. So in today's lecture, um, I'm going to be talking about the importance of performance um, as one of the three pillars of my conceptualization. Um, of diplomacy as theater and its demonstrable significance in understanding symbolic meanings in global diplomacy. My case study for understanding performativity in global diplomacy is the Bandung Conference, um, officially known as the Asian African Conference. So in April 1955, the five Colombo powers of India, Pakistan, Ceylon, Burma, and Indonesia jointly hosted the largest conference of newly post-colonial Asian and African states with 29 delegations in total in the West Javanese city of Bandung. This conference is often interpreted as the defining post-colonial moment in the history of decolonization. I have argued elsewhere that one of the most powerful performative moments at the Bandung Conference was the Freedom Walk, uh, which is so powerfully evocative because of its ability to project three-dimensionally the pro-independence dream of the road to freedom uh, through the very act of walking towards the Freedom Building. So, sorry, I'm going to show you the first. So, this is what I'm basically talking about. Um, so, on the opening day of the conference of 18, or on 18th of April, delegates walked the last 50 meters along the Asia Africa Road to the main conference venue, Freedom Building. It was a stroke of genius that Sukarno had renamed the key conference sites only 10 days before in order to map out a stage for the theater of diplomacy to take place in Bandung, as might be expected from a leader who fashioned himself as a Dalang, or the master puppeteer in the Javanese shadow puppet theater tradition. In Sukarno's vision, city of Bandung was reimagined as a symbolic map of post-colonial Asia Africa, where the simple act of walking down the road from the hotel to the conference building could metamorphose into a symbolic performance of freedom. So in this lecture, we focus on this freedom walk in order to illustrate how the most routine action, that is, conference delegates walking along the road to the venue could have a transformative effect, turning it into a significant performative moment in global diplomacy. 
Tsukano well understood the historical symbolism of this event, not only because he was a revolutionary romantic, but because he was keenly aware of the political expediency of having to capitalize on the recently found fame of the Republic of Indonesia in the world of post-colonial diplomacy by convening this conference and being the host state. Principally, what follows focuses on forms of non-verbal communication as a means of understanding the symbolic in international diplomacy. Not only was the Freedom Walk seen to encapsulate the spirit, spirit of what the Bandung Conference meant and represented to contemporaries, it, it had later come to assume an even greater historical mantle by situating Bandung as a symbolic birthplace of the global south. So in creating this global narrative, Indonesia played a key role. This is a story about how powerful symbolic diplomacy can be if harnessed effectively to generate an imagined community of political belonging surviving long after the original event in 1955. Such a compelling narrative can also provoke strong feelings of disenfranchisement and anger. If we recast the freedom walk through the lens of gender, what becomes evident is the striking absence of women as protagonists. Hence the walk was a highly gendered performance, even though it was couched in the political language of freedom and independence. The overly masculine and triumphalist tone inadvertently revealed hidden histories of women and of their unfulfilled promises of nationalist struggles in newly post-colonial societies of Asia and Africa. No doubt other such hidden stories abound but remain without a voice. The story of the Freedom Walk uh, is thus more complex than first meets the eye. Now I'm going to talk about the performance, uh, performing freedom. So world statesmen as key diplomatic actors are often perceived by audiences to be personifications of the states they represent. Uh, hence the giving of a strong stage performance becomes even more critical to creating a positive national image in international politics. The sociologist Irving Goffman noted, and I quote, a performance may be defined as all the activity of a given participant on a given occasion which serves to influence in any way any of the other participants. Close quotation. After all, performance is always performance for someone, some audience that recognizes and validates it as performance, even when, as it is occasionally the case, that audience is the self, end quotation. For the general public, these publicly visible performative acts are doubly important as a method of symbolic communication. One notable characteristic of the way in which diplomatic stage was set in Bandung was the official provision made to allow for close physical access of the people of Bandung to conference delegates. This became a critical factor in contributing to a certain festival-like atmosphere during the conference, as there was a continual spatial interaction between the people and the delegates in the Asian African Conference Zone. The key streets in the conference zone, such as the Asia Africa Road, and Diponegro Road, where the conference venues were situated, remained busy with school children, housewives, and the general public, as they eagerly waited for world statesmen to emerge from meetings to catch a glimpse of them, but also to enjoy watching foreigners going about busily conferencing in Bandung. To avoid traffic congestion around Freedom Building, on the day of the opening ceremony on the 18th, the Joint Secretariat of the conference had asked the delegates to walk from Savoy Home and Hotel, which was about 50 meters away, or Grand Hotel Prianga, which was about 100 meters away, 
to the venue. Those key leaders who were given individual residences further north in the conference zone uh, on Tamansari Road, for example, where John Lai stayed, or uh, Lembong Road, where Nehru, Nasa, Sir John Kotelawala, Ali Sastra Mijoyo um, arrived in their Mercury cars to Asia Africa Road and alighted their limousines to walk the final short stretch to the Freedom Building. In the entrance of, lobby, of the hotel lobby of Savoy Homan, um, delegates would wait for their colleagues to assemble. Then, as if on cue, they emerged from the hotel one after another and walked down Asia Africa Road, much to the delight of the audience. So spontaneously, an interactive, um, a remarkable interactive performance occurred between the Asian and African statesmen and the people of Bandung through gesture and bodily comportment infused with emotional or emotive energy, seeing that gestures can be a powerful means of communicating affirmation and solidarity. And this is what the roads look like. Um, so in close proximity to, the, uh, to these very famous leaders, the public could take photographs, um, photographs of them, and if very lucky, get their autographs and even a handshake. One Indonesian reporter wrote, and I quote here, did you know that Nasser always causes quite a stir in the lobby when he makes his entrance or exit? Autograph hunters flocked to him more than any of the other VIPs. Laughingly, he readily signs all autograph books. The crowds seem oblivious of the police, pushing them aside, and Nasser, with his friendly smile, signs his name tirelessly in all those books. End quotation. The most successful autograph hunter was the one who succeeded in accosting all 29 leaders for an album of prized collection. Joe's photograph, or oh, sorry, autograph, uh, which was the most challenging to obtain, had a going price of 150 rupias in the black market. Pickpockets kept themselves busy whilst delegates were signing autographs as cases were reported to the Bandung police. The crowd clapped every time when the delegation passed in front of them. It's not clear whether the public was happy because they can see, one by one, members of the delegations arrive at such a short distance, or whether they were attracted by the variety of national clothes worn by the delegations of the Gold Coast, Ethiopia, Ceylon, Burma, and India, which looked very attractive. The spontaneity of the occasion rendered a powerful visual imagery um, with the great men of Asia and Africa, uh, as, and I put it in quotation marks, great men uh, of Asia and Africa, striding purposefully towards the Freedom Building amidst cheering crowds and making of the iconography of the Bandung Conference in later years. It was during Sukarno's Freedom Walk with Hatta, Mohammed Hatta, who was the uh, deputy president, when the crowd excitedly cheered and shouted, Merdeka, freedom, or a rallying call commonly associated with a long history of Indonesian struggle for independence. For Nehru too, uh, whenever he waved at the crowd, the latter would respond with a chorus of Merdeka Pak, freedom sir. In no time, Merdeka became an unofficial bonding call as a new ritual between the crowd who responded enthusiastically to every passing Bandung leader, uh, so every, uh, shouting Merdeka across the security cordon that separated them. In so doing, the townspeople and Asian African leaders merged effortlessly into one space which was both playful and emotive. So on this opening day, Joe, and I think, Oh, sorry, this is NASA, a picture of NASA, and it's actually taken at night, so I couldn't find a photograph of him uh, on the opening, but um, you can see. And this is John Lai um, from PRC, had committed a diplomatic faux pas. Outside Freedom Building, a heaving crowd waited for hours, craning their 
next to get a glimpse of the famous Chinese leader and duly expected to be rewarded for their enthusiastic display of fandom. To their disappointment, Joe had not realized that an impromptu uh, ritual had spontaneously sprung up between the leaders and the crowd outside the Freedom Building and quickly disappeared inside the building without turning around at the top of the steps to wave at the crowd. Within a few um, moments, however, Joe reappeared to wave at the crowd. This mishap did not go unnoticed, as an Indonesian women's magazine lamented. His smile is a little bit expensive. Nonetheless, the same magazine could not help but be smitten by the handsome Chinese leader. For someone who was already 56 years old, he still looked virile. For the benefit of the crowd standing outside the building, the Joint Secretariat had mounted loudspeakers to broadcast the speeches made by the leaders. Undeterred by the tropical downpour, the crowd clung on to every word of Joe's, even though their clothes drenched and were glued onto their bodies. Unlike his previous diplomatic exploits, including the notable success he scored at Geneva in 1954, Bandung necessitated a different approach to diplomacy. Joe was quick to recognize that it paid to play up to the crowd at Bandung because popularity mattered greatly in being accepted by the conference and into the emergent Asia-Africa collective. Hence, public diplomacy at Bandung was interactive and not a one-way communication. Nehru, Nasser, and Joe easily won the popularity poll. They were the biggest crowd pullers and pleasers. Amongst the three, NASA elicited an adoring gaze from the crowd of a different order. NASA was a young revolutionary icon of the time. With his virile appearance and his military uniform, he received special attention. And I'm actually quoting here, so these are not my words. Um, according to a Life magazine photographer, I quote, Colonel Nasser is a very handsome man. He's over six feet tall and has the frame and sex appeal of an all-American football player. Every time he ventured out on the streets of Bandung, Indonesian bobby socks went wild, end quotation. Not only did Bandung Bells cast admiring glances at the broad-shouldered and tall Egyptian leader, but he was popular with the top Indonesian officers who visited him. His infectious smile was a potent diplomatic weapon with which he won over the crowd time and time again. A gushing fan said, no wonder he can start a revolution in Egypt. His body is so virile, his hand is so strong that it can destroy steel. So somehow the very body of Nasser was seen to symbolize the virility of Egypt reborn. The masculinity of Nasser, almost akin to a sexualized icon, um, symbolized the emergent type of a new populist leader. Superficially, his appeal rested on physical appearance combined with his seeming ease at working with the crowd, working the crowd more easily relatable in celebrity culture. Masculinity, especially virility, mattered greatly to popular audiences as those were the visible qualities which made some leaders more charismatic than others. Popular penchant for wanting leaders, uh, wanting masculine appeal in post revolutionary leaders excludes the imaginary of women as leaders. In this idealized discourse of masculinity, women do not have a place. Whilst the popular audience gushed and swooned over Nasser's sex appeal, what became visibly evident was the physical metamorphosis of Nasser in the eyes of the public. Previous to Bandung, Nasser came across usually as a serious, if not dividend, army officer, certainly not the charismatic type uh, who had the charm to captivate the global audience. In this sense, Nasser 
reinvented himself in Bandung with the support of a wildly appreciative crowd who gave him the confidence he lacked at home in Egypt. In the Egyptian vernacular press too, Nasser's diplomatic prowess was rated highly. The largest Egyptian daily, Al Gomhuria, credited Nasser for scoring on Palestine and the North African questions, as echoed in Al Ahram and Al Akbar. As the youngest son, youngest of the high-profile Bandung leaders, Nasser inevitably stood out. I think I'm probably running slightly behind, but anyway, for, for the want of a better term, Nasser literally blossomed in Bandung in the eyes of the Arab world, which had been initially skeptical of the young Egyptian leader's capabilities. The Tehran Journal wrote, the applause with which his speech, Nasser's speech, was followed was an expression of the impact the young Egyptian leader has made on the Asian African statesman in his first contact with international politics. Next to Nehru and Joe and Lai, Nasser has excited more interest than any other delegate uh, to the 29 nation conference. Sent such sentiments were echoed by the American State Department's assessment of Nasser's strong staged performance at Bandung. Thereafter, Nasser becomes argu arguably the most highly recognizable Arab leader in the world. Asian African cosmopolitanism of Bandung made Nasser an Arab spokesman with a global appeal, something which had evaded him hitherto in his own national context. So popular audiences were seduced by a brand of revolutionary uh, masculine aesthetics uh, exuded by some of these leaders. Even Joe, who was nearly 20 years older than Nasser, was written up as though he was a communist pinup. Star Weekly, which is the Jakarta magazine, reported, reported excitedly people could not stop talking about Joe's eyebrows, which were thick and black. Even the American embassy in Jakarta dispatched this confidential assessment of Joe that, and I quote here, in his public performances, Joe possessed great stage presence. He was dignified, calm, affable, and subtly conveyed the feeling that he ought to be the main figure of the conference." Close quotation. Nehru, who acted as his mother hen, gushed to his friend Edwina Mountbatten that Joe was a star performer. Joe clearly did not disappoint Nehru, even though Nehru's own standing as the pinnacle of the newly post-colonial Asia-Africa was affected most profoundly by Joe, who was seen by many to have overshadowed the Indian leader. The US State Department, which had an uneasy relationship with Nehru, uh, concluded that the personal failure of Nehru was one important outcome of the conference. End quotation. Joe had won a major diplomatic battle earlier at the Geneva Conference in 1954, and it was his reputation established there which led to heightened expectations about the communist leader at Bandung. It was the Af African American writer in exile, Richard Wright, uh, who incisively pointed to Joe's civilized and even elegant embodiment of communist values through his behavioral conduct, making the rest of Afro-Asian uh, Afro states feel safe with communism. And I a quote from the um, um, Richard Wright's book here, be nice, no more clenched fists, give them all a glad welcome. All over Bandung, communists were affable, shaking hands with their former enemies, waving aside all references to past hatreds and slanders, doing all in their power to heal old wounds. So in this sense, the ability to switch from an awe-inspiring, clenched-fisted revolutionary to an urbane, sophisticated, and dispassionate diplomat 
worked like magic at Bandung. Moreover, the narrative of suffering authenticated and legitimized these leaders in the eyes of the public in their new roles as statesmen. In Sukarno's choreographed space for the celebration of Asian African independence, the performative power of the freedom walk was demonstratively effective. Focusing on the performative aspect of diplomacy helped to shed light on the role of emotions in diplomacy. According to Catherine Cole, performance resonates simultaneously in several different registers, including reason, emotion, and experience. Indeed, the Freedom Walk was a fine example of a post-colonial theatrical performance which resonated with the affective and experiential registers of those who observed the conference directly and also vicariously through the messaging of the global media. Even more, the romanticized nostalgia surrounding the Bandung myth is in part due to the conference having emotional impact on contemporaries and on subsequent visionaries through public memory. Bandung was about the reaffirmation of the post-colonial normative order, which included as a primary ingredient the affective factor of the post-colonial experiences. For many Bandung countries, these performative acts of independence helped to reinforce the sense of national unity, whilst at the same time they acted as symbols of the unity of the Afro-Asian world. It was Carlos Romulo, the chief delegate of the Philippines and a stalwart ally of the United States, who noted that conference was permeated, permeated by a rare spirit of historical continuity, which could have only come of shared experience. The rare spirit of emotional continuum akin to an imagined community created out of the perceived shared experiences of newly post-colonial states seem to have emerged. Importantly then, it was the perception of sharing experiences that mattered. And the conference turned into a space of commu uh, performing communally the road to freedom through symbolic actions, notably through the Freedom Walk on Asia-Africa Road to the Freedom Building, a pantheon of new post-colonial leaders that reaffirmed their shared emotive values. Now I'm going to move on to my second reading of the same walk. And um, it's, um, it's basically on women in the Freedom Walk. So powerfully evocative as a metaphor for the road to freedom, the Freedom Walk was equally striking for the conspicuous absence of women. Where were the women? The lens of gender opens up a new and critical reading of the walk by unearthing hidden histories of women in post-colonial, uh, post-independence uh, narrative. The media reported that not a single woman delegate was present in the conference that represented 1.4 billion people worldwide condemning the optimal state of female representation. At once visibly masculine, the performative nature of the Freedom Walk inadvertently exposed the marginalization of women in the new post-colonial Asian African diplomatic pageantry or imaginary. Apart from a handful of women who paraded alongside male leaders as consorts, the Freedom Walk for Asian and African women ended up being about performing the invisibility of women in global diplomacy. Their physical absence from the walk could be considered a performance in itself. In other words, women performing invisibility, and quite effectively so, as their absence did not go unnoticed in some sections of the media. Importantly, the paucity of women's presence in the Freedom Walk was strikingly evident in visual sources. 
Who were the hand of, handful of women who did take part in the Freedom Walk? In the opening photograph for Sukarno, I'm going to go back to the first photograph here, this one, um, we see Fatmawati, uh, the first lady of the Republic. Sorry, I don't really know how to. Do I do this? Oh, yes. So this is, Pat this is Sukarno. This is Fatmawati here. Um, so Fatmawati was the wife of um, Skarno. At the age of 32, clad in Javanese dress, demurely covering her head with a white, long, lacy shawl called Kudung. She's walking to the left of her husband, um, giving him a wide berth so as to enable a military officer to walk in between them to protect the president. Positioned to the far left of the presidential entourage, she is kneeling, nearly falling out of the frame. Sukarno was meant to be the center of attention, and she clearly understood this as evidenced in her self-effacing uh, demeanor and her physical position in the walk. Immediately behind her uh, is walk Siti Rahmat Wati Hatta, who... Um, Maybe you can see it a bit. She's this lady here, next to, um, or be just behind Fatma Wati. Um, and she is the wife, or she was the wife of the Vice President Mohammed Hatta, contrasting against the former with the lack of the head shawl. Now, Mohammed Hatta, who was the Vice President, is walking further back than his wife. He's the man with glasses, um, sort of, he's this guy here, here. Um, is walking further back than his wife, though more aligned to the center of the presidential entourage. In spite of Fatma Wati's seemingly subservient position, the choreography of the key personages reveals that Fatma Wati, as Ibu Negara, uh, formed an integral part of the Indonesian presidential party, whether, where her husband would play a role as the preordained leader of the emerging Afro-Asia. In the eyes of the Indonesian pub public, Fatma Wati held an indisputable standing in the nationalist narrative. In the widely circulated photographs taken on the 17th of August, 1945, and I'm going to show you the photo, this one. This is a very famous photograph of the moment when Sukarno and Mohammed Hatta read out the proclamation of independence um, after the Japanese surrender on the 15th of August, 1945, from Sukarno's house in Jakarta. And Fatma Wati stood with them in her Javanese dress and the head show to witness the flag raising ceremony. So she is the lady here, this one with the heads, this one is Fatma Wati. And Fatma Wati stood with them, yes, uh, and the reason why it, it was Fatma Wati who made the very first national flag of Mura Putti, which is the red and white, by sewing together two pieces of cloth, one red and the other white, uh, which was hoisted up the flagpole on that auspicious day, as you see there, the flag being hoisted up. Uh, she was the first Ibu Negara, which, was gen which has generally come to be translated as first lady. Yet the combination of the Indonesian uh, words can also imply the mother of the nation. Considering her historic role in the proclamation of independence and the public imaginary of Fatma Wati as the first Ibu Negara, uh, would likely have had a deeper symbolic resonance connected with the founding narrative of the Republic of Indonesia. Hence, her participation in the Freedom Walk was politically meaningful because of her official positionality uh, as the embodied representation of the women of Indonesia. Nonetheless, the rest of the world hardly took notice of Fatma Wati, uh, the demure wife of Sukarno and the First Lady of Indonesia, underlying a profound difference in her positionality between the national and global contexts. 
The ambivalence of the role of Ibu Negra as it pertained to Fatmawati is significant because it offers a gendered contrast to the prevalence of the founding father role in the independence narratives of post-colonial uh, polities, more generally speaking. In 2000, Fatmawati uh, was honored as a national hero of Indonesia. Uh, announced in the lead up to the Heroes' Day, with her daughter Megawati Skarnoputri uh, set to become the first female president of the Republic in 2001. Even after death, therefore, Fatmawati continues to provide legitimacy to the Sukarno dynasty as one of the two first ladies to have been bestowed the honor of being a national hero. Paradoxically, it was the paucity of women in the freedom walk that had the effect of highlighting contemporary feminist politics in some Asian societies, especially the issue of polygamy practiced by two leaders among the sp uh, sponsoring states of the Bandung Conference. Polygamy was one of the two most pressing concerns, um, pressing and long-standing issues, the other being women's education, and in women's movement in Indonesia dating back to the colonial period. Ironically, the very visibility of Sukarno's uh, parading with Fatmawati had ignited a debate on pol uh, polygamy, or more accurately, polygyny. Fatmawati herself was the third wife of Sukarno, bearing him five children after marrying him in 1943. In 1953, two years before the conference, however, Sukarno had married another woman, Hartini, in spite of Fatmawati's refusal to divorce him. Hence, Fatmawati is carrying the torch as the Ibu Negara at Bandung could be construed as a public act of defiance against Sukarno's uh, polygynous marriage to Hartini. The Indonesian public dissatisfaction in some quarters over demonstrations of polygamy by two of the five Colombo leaders can be traced to the beginnings of feminism in Indonesia during the Dutch colonial times. Kartini, the first widely acknowledged feminist of the Indonesian people, was a Javanese aristocrat, and polygamy ranked as one of the two objectives for activism in her short but influential life. Since then, polygamy remained an important feminist platform well into the post-independence era. As the Indonesian women's movement fought alongside Indonesian nationalist movement to overthrow the Dutch, polygamy became a fight for the equality of women. Polygamy was a national feminist issue that united various women's movements belonging to Christians, both Catholics and Protestants, and Muslims. Yet, different groups could not agree on whether to push for a complete ban of polygamy as was the case on the part of Christians, or instead work towards a more incremental betterment of rights of women whilst accepting polygamy uh, on the part of Muslims. In general, polygyny was an extremely rare practice associated with the Priyayi class, the upper class in uh, Java, and as a symbol of high status, at least in Javanese society. So Sukarno, among the three key Indonesian leaders at the conference, um, others being Mohamed Hatta and Prime Minister Ali Sastra Mijoyo, was the most traditional in his outlook um, on women and marriage. What exacerbated uh, Sukarno's position was that he had been an ardent supporter of women's, um, sorry, women's movement in the period of the national struggle, encouraging women to be part of the revolutionary struggle in attaining, attaining gender equality of Indonesian men and women, only to be exposed that it was a lip service he had paid to have women join in on the struggle for independence. Hence, Sukarno was hypocritical in his stance, mainly because his revolutionary rhetoric and daily practice diverged considerably. To make matters doubly worse, 
the social class most affected by problems of polygamy was the well-to-do class, only the top few percentage of the Indonesian population. These were the women who participated in the revolutionary struggle most visibly, and paradoxically, it was their class that was most affected by uh, polygamy. Relative to the contributions made by Indonesian women in the revolutionary struggle, the fact of the invisibility from official freedom walk uh, in the post-colonial celebration at Bandung, uh, exposing the reality of women's position in, in the post-colonial Indonesia. Moreover, symbolic invisibility of women in formal diplomacy as epitomized in the walk had wider implications for the role of women in newly post-colonial countries, generally such as in Pakistan, and indeed, um, and, and indeed further afield. Women's movements shared their collective disillusionment with the onset of the status quo uh, in their respective societies after the initial euphoria of independence, independence had died down as women's issues became marginalized in public debates on post-colonial state building. So Sukarno's espousal of polygamy had antagonized Indonesian women's groups. Um, and so, sorry, uh, and small wonder then that the Pakistani Prime Minister, Mohammed Ali Bogra, who arrived in Bandung with Ali Asadi. Uh, this is uh, Mohammed Bogra, Pakistani Prime Minister, with his um, newly wedded wife, Ali Asadi. Uh, got under fire from women's movements in Pakistan and Indonesia. In the Freedom Walk, Muhammad Ali walked proudly with his newly wedded wife, side by side, uh, which was a striking contrast to how Sukarno had walked with Fatma Wati, pushed aside to the left-hand side of the frame. So Ali and Muhammad Ali, uh, as she became to be known, uh, was the Prime Minister's second wife. And her presence at Bandung caused quite a stir and considerable agitation. A news headline screamed out, Mrs. Ali number two is now in Bandung. The Pakistan Times published an article, Protest Against Ali's Second Marriage, in which uh, it reported a meeting of Pakistani women demanding of the boycott of second wives, stating that polygamy was only a allowable if a wife is incapable of bearing children or has been suffering from some disease. Now, Muhammad Ali Bogra's first wife, Begum Hamida, had borne him two sons. Voicing regret over the attendance of the conference by Ali's second wife, um, it demanded that the status and the title of the first lady belong to Begum Hamida, i.e. Uh, uh, Bogra's first wife and not to the second wife, a Canadian Lebanese who had been the social secretary of the prime ministers before the marriage. The problem was seemingly compounded by the fact that Alia Sadi was a foreigner, leading to placards such as, go back Alia Sadi. In fact, this issue resulted in a protest march in um, Pakistani, uh, of Pakistani women to the Pakistani Prime Minister's residence. An anti-polygamy letter was delivered by the group uh, uh, which had been formed in the capital city, Karachi, the day before. Because of the official position uh, as Prime Minister, Muhammad Ali's personal life choice had become a symbolic public matter, causing national embarrassment to Pakistan and the Pakistani people in the eyes of the international audience. Now, um, Indonesian women's uh, magazine, Wanita, uh, made its own views known. Um, I have a quotation here, but I'm going, I'm going to miss this one because I think I'm, I need to finish in uh, about five minutes. And this, this matter had even reached the home news service bulletin of the BBC. So what Muhammad Ali's second marriage did was to undermine the accepted social norm amongst Muslims in South Asia, where polygamy had been a restricted practice 
and the reformers had been pushing for strengthening the legal position of Muslim women with their communities. His decision to take Ali Asadi to Bandung had created a focal point for the anti-polygamy -poly movement in Pakistan and had repercussions for women's citizenship rights in Pakistan and the Muslim family law. So inadvertently, Fatma Wati and Ali Asadi ended up performing their roles in the freedom world as the first lady and the second wife, respectively, thereby personifying the stakes in the debate on polygamy. Fatma Wati as Ibn Negara represented the right for first wife, and in some places depicted as the wronged first wife, is amplified by her modest and humble demeanor during the conference, whilst Ali Sadi represented the second wife, challenging the role of the first wife and of the first lady of Pakistan. The spectacle, spectacle made by Muhammad Ali and his new wife became a moment of crystallization for the problems of post-colonial situation in which women's movement in Pakistan had found itself. Hence, it came to encapsulate the frustrations experienced in the national women's struggle projected onto the wider Asian African screen. At Bandung, what united the Muslim women of South Asia and Indonesia was anti-polygamy. However, both the presence was marked, largely marked by silence on their part, an absence of their own voice. Um, I can talk about Indira Gandhi if this, uh, during the Q&A, if there is any um, question, but I'm going to pass this um, and just conclude this section, which is to say that women played a multiplicity of roles at Bandung, and this will become even more evident if we turn attempt, attempt, if we turn attempt to understand, uh, attention to understand diplomacy through the lens of sociability, where women played a significant role. So as a conclusion, um, little did Sukarno know that the Freedom Walk would have a major diplomatic revival uh, with the 50th anniversary of the Bandung Conference in, um, in 2005. And this is a, the photograph. So in 2005, the Indonesian government uh, invited 106 states representing 4.5 billion people um, of the world, which was some 73% of the global population at the time, to attend the Golden Jubilee of the 1955 conference in Bandung in Jakarta. Um, so some 89 countries were re represented by heads of states or ministers out of these countries. The Secretary General, Kofi Annan, if those of you remember him, uh, is there uh, with his wife. Um, taking the front line in the, um, in the walk. And Hu Jintao was also there on the Asia-Africa uh, road in Bandung. To underline the importance of Bandung as the place of global diplomacy, Asian and African Conference Museum in the city comes under the auspices of the Ministry of External Affairs of Indonesia. So essentially, the Freedom Building was subsequently turned into an Asian the Asian African Conference Museum in Bandung at the anniversary of the 20, uh, 25th anniversary of the conference. Um, and that is really the principal venue. And this, this museum is very unusual in that it is actually run by the Ministry of External Affairs uh, in Indonesia. And um, it's one of the best documented museums that I've been to in Indonesia. Um, so in 2015, Indonesia again invited the Global South leaders to Bandung um, and is fast establishing itself as the decennial event on global diplomacy circuit. I mean, this commemoration every 10 years, the, uh, the Indonesian government wants to hold a kind of mem memorial or the commemoration of the 1955 conference. So let us conclude by considering the role of temporality in um, essentializing and consecrating the freedom walk in historical memory um, with much resonance to contemporary politics of the global south. 
temporality is important in understanding why the Freedom Walk came to gain increasing importance over time. If you look at the literature on rituals, the significance of ritual rests on two things. One is symbolism, uh, which that ritual embodies in its material materiality, its performance, and its interpretation. Another is the particular temporality it memorializes, um, reinforced by repetition over time, so that, be, so that it becomes a ritual citation inscribed, as it were, in historical memory. Hence, we can argue that the Freedom Walk gained even more importance through the passage of time, um, though not all symbolic meanings remain equally important in their afterlives. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And thank you very much for inviting me uh, to hear uh, Professor Haneda. I really appreciate it. And uh, Professor uh, Shimazu, I really appreciate your very eloquent uh, presentation. Uh, so I think not only me, but everyone here uh, today uh, feel as if we are at the Asian, uh, Asian African Road uh, back to uh, 1955, April. So um, before going into the detail, uh, let me introduce myself. Because uh, I'm not uh, originally uh, coming from history uh, studies or cultural studies. I'm, uh, with the introduction, uh, said, uh, I'm coming from uh, political science and international studies. But uh, I also study about uh, diplomacy uh, from my own angle. So I study diplomacy uh, from, uh, especially by uh, archive staff uh, on American diplomacy and also Japanese history. But uh, the difference uh, I have uh, from uh, Professor Shimazu is I normally focus on bilateral uh, negotiation and also uh, unilateral uh, policy making process within that country. So from that sense, I uh, really uh, impressed by her studies, not only today's lecture, but uh, by her many uh, academic papers on uh, diplomacy as theater, uh, because it is uh, the really, uh, I can say, a uh, big study uh, on the importance of diplomacy, especially in multilateral front, multilateral negotiation. So today, the, the very uh, important point from today's lecture is, of course, uh, diplomacy as theater. And, uh, and Professor Simazu uh, uh, had two big readings uh, from Freedom Walk and Bandung Conference uh, in 1955. On, on the one hand, uh, C uh, taught us about the uh, symbol, symbol uh, or symbolity of Bandung Conference as national unity and also uh, Asian African unity. And, and, and in addition to that, uh, C also uh, explained the, uh, the importance of gender perspective uh, to interpret uh, the uh, Freedom Walk and also Bandung Conference itself. So it is uh, really eye-opening, and, uh, uh, and this is really interesting for me because uh, woman was there, but woman's, how can I say, not function, but the woman's law was not there so much. Uh, so uh, it is, uh, and, and also uh, it was really interesting uh, to hear uh, this uh, Bandon conference open the criticism uh, against the polygamy uh, in some countries. Uh, by the, uh, so it is very interesting. Of, of course, you know, uh, Bandung Conference itself is really dramatic. Uh, like, uh, before coming here, I did some essays uh, at that time, I mean, uh, back to 1955, and one essay which was written by a uh, journalist by, uh, at Le Monde, uh, Paris, Paris, he said this could be the starting point of, you know, uh, League of Nations in Asia. So I think uh, uh, Bandung Conference meaning uh, has not been well understood in today's uh, Asia, but actually it was a very big dramatic event uh, for Asia and Africa uh, in a post-colonial context. And also, uh, I think uh, uh, it, uh, it was not mentioned in today's lecture, but uh, uh, Zhou Enlai uh, was about to be killed. Uh, before coming to 
abandoned because uh, if you uh, remember, a Casimir Princess incident uh, happened just before uh, the Bandon Conference, and uh, uh, many Chinese people are uh, killed uh, in that accident. Anyway, uh, so uh, it was a very interesting lecture. Uh, so, and uh, what I realized is uh, the multilateral conference or international conference has uh, really uh, many functions, not only for coordinate uh, the policies, but also uh, first to create identity as a member of the club. So uh, in Bandon Conference, uh, many countries should, and governments uh, should have, uh, should get or should gain uh, some sort of identity as a member of the club. And uh, in Sh Professor Shima's other article at the Diplomatica, uh, she introduced a very important concept, inclusive sociability and exclusive sociability. But uh, I think the identity in, as a club member uh, should be one very important function of, uh, of uh, that theater, I mean, the international conference. But the second important meaning is uh, what I learned today is uh, the theater or international conference was a place or is a place uh, to create or to reproduce the image. Uh, so, uh, like the, uh, Mr. Nassau was a really good example uh, for that, uh, I can say, metamorphose, metamorphose uh, of the image uh, of himself. So, uh, it was a very really good opportunity for them uh, to change uh, their own uh, image in international society. And uh, in addition to that, the third function uh, should be uh, the international conference as a place uh, to introduce culture uh, to international audience. Uh, in, also in her, I mean, Shima's uh, other article, uh, she emphasized the uh, function of food. And yes, uh, international conference uh, was a really good place uh, to introduce uh, to international audience the new culture, food, performance, and also a uh, clothing. But uh, having said that, I think you know many functions was were possible uh, because that has been done until 20th century, because everything was uh, before the real globalization. So uh, <clears throat> now I think you know uh, it is very difficult uh, to go some international conference and to encounter the real new cultural things even food, clothing, and performance, I think that is more accessible uh, you know, even before or even without going to the conference or international diplomatic theater. So, uh, so for me, you know, uh, the episode of Bandon Conference was a really typical uh, pre-globalization moment, if uh, I, uh, I try to exaggerate uh, my rhetoric. But anyway, so abandoned conference, but at that time uh, was uh, really important and at least among uh, the participant countries, member states, uh, journalism, uh, that had a really big moment, big, big uh, uh, meaning. But another very interesting point is that uh, characteristics or that functions of uh, international conference as theater was not widely shared beyond the member states, I think. I mean, like, uh, the Japan, as you know, Japan's position to Bandung Conference was uh, really, really ambivalent. <laughs> but uh, uh, I just uh, checked a uh, major newspaper at that moment uh, in Japan. And of course, you know, uh, the opening ceremony was broadcasted in Japan. I mean, media reported uh, uh, on April 18th. And uh, this is like Asahi Shimbun, and this is uh, uh, evening uh, edition. And it's, uh, it is just uh, one page, I mean, the front page. And the front page says uh, opening remarks got a big, pro big applause, and uh, uh, representatives uh, wear uh, many cultural uh, clothing. Well, this is a good thing. But uh, another, uh, so they gave attention to some extent. Uh, but uh, another uh, major newspaper, this is Mainichi Shimbun, 
uh, of course, you know, it also has a headline, say, uh, uh, peace and unity uh, was emphasized. But the second uh, subtitle says, uh, it looked like exhibition of race. So I was really shocked to uh, read this uh, head type and subtitle. And actually, this uh, subtitle and the news here uh, was about the freedom walk. So, but that freedom walk was firstly not mentioned well. I mean, it, it just described so many people gathered in front of the hotel. And then it stated, this is exhibition of race. So I think uh, such an enthusiasm was not there, uh, you know, even though Japan and Japanese media uh, should know uh, the real historical meaning of this event. So uh, this, my second point is, so how much, how wide uh, the meaning of diplomatic theater uh, was uh, shared uh, beyond the uh, member state or uh, the true participant of that uh, theater. So, <clears throat> and, and also I feel the Bandung conference was so special or too much special because, you know, um, first, it was multilateral uh, format. Second, uh, it was held at a very historic moment uh, after the Second World War and in the process of uh, post-decolonization. So uh, it was a really historic moment. So Bandung Conference uh, did succeed in uh, gaining the uh, historic, historical uh, value. But could we really find out any other good example of uh, diplomacy as theater, I mean, uh, like Bandon. I really, I try to figure out a uh, good example. And as I said, I'm originally a specialist of uh, modern diplomacy. So uh, for example, uh, I can come up with a good example is a 1972 uh, United States China, I mean, Nixon and Mao uh, summit uh, in Beijing and Shanghai. I don't think you know uh, it did have the, it. I, I think it didn't have the uh, uh, historical. I mean, such a I can say uh, sense of symbolism or uh, you know uh, such a uh, big meaning uh, or you know such a performance didn't create uh, big impacts on uh, the negotiation itself or. Uh, and, and the modern example could be like inter-Korean summit uh, back to 2018 uh, between Kim Jong-un and Moon Jae-in. It should be more historic. I mean, it could be. Because you know, it was a very big meeting between two uh, Korean leaders uh, to meet. But I don't think you know, they have received such a uh, sense, of, uh, fest fest sense of festival uh, or uh, or any performance did create uh, the big impacts on uh, the people, even within Korea, member states of that uh, uh, diplomacy. So uh, thinking like this way, I really think, you know, uh, coming back to my original point, so after globalization and after uh, democratization of diplomacy with technology, uh, Festi festivality, or I don't know how to say it, but uh, uh, to create a festival like Bandung Conference and to create the historic meaning or symbolism is uh, really difficult to attain. So, uh, uh, so this is you know uh, my uh, take uh, from your uh, very uh, interesting uh, presentation. So uh, this could be a history, uh, but uh, could we really get another Bandon conference uh, in the future? Of course, you know, any government want to do the same thing. I mean, want to have such a big, want to get such a big historic meaning by their diplomacy, even today. Uh, 
in a few weeks, we have a Shangri-La dialogue in Singapore. Maybe you know, the host organization and local governments really want to get such a big symbolism from that conference. But I really don't think any Shangri-La dialogue uh, could get such a you know, sense of a uh, festival or uh, uh, the very big meaning. Uh, so, uh, and look at the uh, Summit for Democracy last year by Biden administration, last year, December. It was a big failure in terms of uh, diplomacy as a theater, I think, because you know, it couldn't get any sense of unity or it couldn't get any shared meaning among the uh, outside observers. So, of course, you know, uh, they did have some uh, problem uh, of themselves, like uh, didn't have good design, didn't have good, uh, how can I say, uh, architecture of, of the venue, or they failed to have uh, good, simp good, how can I say, uh, decorations of the venue and other things. But, but in addition to that, uh, I'm now stopping my uh, comment, but uh, uh, I feel, you know, now at this modern age, it is really difficult to deceive uh, uh, the kind of shared enthusiasm uh, among observers. So, uh, Bandon Conference uh, is a really, really good uh, uh, example of theater, uh, I mean, diplomacy as theater, but I really don't think we could have the second theater uh, in the future. So, uh, thank you very much for uh, your uh, very interesting presentation. Um, well, thank you very much for um, very insightful comments. And, um, and I think, and also for reading my other papers too. <laughs> thank you, because it's sort of like we're supposed to come together in a way. Now, I'm actually very interested um, by what you said, which is that um, I think maybe uh, the, the things that I've been writing about Bandung, including the presentation today, uh, is actually about trying to understand the 1955 conference uh, as a case of sort of like symbolic performance. And that symbolic performance best came through in this particular kind of, um, you know, what you, what you call festival kind of like atmosphere. And in fact, that was, uh, that was actually a dominant prevailing um, kind of, you know, the spirit <laughs> of the conference that certainly I, um, I sort of understood by reading lots of different things and reading stuff. But I think, um, and I do agree with you, that if this theater, diplomatic, uh, diplomacy as theater, is actually about you know, uh, us understanding the kind of the theater aspects of diplomacy, then is it possible to find a better example than Bandu? <laughs> because it is such a good example, isn't it? Yeah. So I, I actually would just like to kind of clarify that um, for me, um, the reason why I'm interested in um, this kind of methodology is, is, is really to understand sort of the, um, the kind of embedded symbolic meanings which are not generally um, understood in, let's say, in a more kind of, you know, traditional ways of understanding diplomacy, diplomatic history, where there is a lot more focus on, you know, what you might call kind of realist, um, you know, uh, interpretations, you know, negotiations based, um, you know, what are the tangible object uh, uh, deliverables <laughs> in today's language, you know, from, from the meetings, uh, et cetera. And I think, you know, maybe you, the way you um, talked about the Shangri-La dialogue, Shangri-La dialogue in Singapore, 
is uh, organized by the Institute of International Institute for Strategic Studies, and it is a sort of regular kind of um, um, point in uh, Singapore's kind of like a diplomatic uh, calendar of the year. But you see, the way I see this kind of approach, I, I, I'm sure I will find something which is not, not necessarily festival, because I'm not looking for festival. It just so happens that for me, it seemed that the best way of um, explaining uh, one of the significant aspects of the Bandung Conference was this kind of like a rather unusual festival-like fe atmosphere, because I'm also very interested in expanding uh, the definition of diplomacy to situate it in the everyday. That's my kind of one of my big objectives in this um, this kind of um, methodological research, which tries to expand the way we actually understand diplomacy. Why should diplomacy be be uh, something which is ex exclusively um, relevant to you know diplomats, statesmen, media, all that? What about the people? Because a lot of diplomacy does have this dimension, which is performative. Even the Shangri-La dialogue, we do see a few clippings on the news, you know, and all that. And those are the few moments that the public actually sees what's happening. So, in other words, I'm kind of quite interested in understanding what, uh, what the public see as diplomacy. And, um, and why shouldn't the public also sort of play a role in what's happening in their society? Uh, be it politics or diplomacy, because in politics, one would never say that the public is not part of uh, politics, right? So why should diplomacy be different? And so, so this, is, this is part of my kind of thing of tr trying to expand the definitional um, well, definitions of diplomacy and try to see it as something that happens in society. And of course, there are different levels of actors, right? So there would be the statesmen, uh, or, and they, there would be the bureaucrats, there would be the media. And also in, uh, in the sociability article, I basically really bring out the role of women in sociability and diplomacy. So in other words, I've always had this question in my mind is why should diplomacy, uh, and particularly even when you look at the conference, Right, it's often the men who are the delegates. And of course, increasingly we see more women as delegates. But why should delegates be the only diplomats? So, in in this kind of bigger project I'm doing with the Oxford Handbook, in fact, um, one of the sections is is really about reconsidering who the diplomatic actors are. Um, so even this kind of you know slightly you know rather binary discussion I had about gender today you know, about men and women. I mean, we, we actually have um, uh, contributors writing about, um, you know, who are the kind of like actors and they, uh, many of them involve basically non-state, non non-traditional actors of diplomacy. Um, so perhaps in this case, in, in the case of Bandung, it is true that I do see this uh, kind of, this incredible coming together of these different peoples, different delegations and townspeople and everybody, and there is something happening, some sort of collective energy emerging out of this. And that's what I try to capture. Um, but for example, um, the Bandung Conference, when I was a student um, of international relations in, in the 1980s, I mean, we just had like one line on Bandung Conference as a failed conference. And that's why I always kind of, I'm, I'm interested, I don't know if you know my first book, but I'm interested in failed cases, because to me they indicate quite a lot about, you know, why do things fail? My first work was on the racial equality proposal at the Paris Peace Conference, and that was seen to be, they had a one line in the textbook too, it failed. <laughs> you know? And so I, as an as a international relations student in the 1980s, I learned Bandung, conference, the Bandung conference, is a failed conference. And so I think the fact that you obviously don't think that is a real transitioning of the way that we, we see Bandung now. 
So when I say that I'm studying on Bandung Conference now, everybody says, yes, oh, that's very interesting. That's a very sort of important you know, point in the history of decolonization. Well, it wasn't. You know, um, I don't know how many years ago, <laughs> 1980s, such a long time ago. But, so in other words, perceptions change about these things um, because we are, our focus change in the way we look at these diplomatic events. But another thing that I think is terribly interesting using this kind of um, cultural approaches is actually the 1943 Greater East Asia Conference, which is another conference known for its failure. It is the most symbolically illuminating conference. So I've actually kind of, I got a little bit of work done on this thing, but um, I think in a way, conferences, which why do people say a conference was successful or not successful. And I think that's a very interesting thing to think about because depending on how you define success, I think that would determine the way you would think about um, you know, these, uh, these events. So I think um, this summit for diplomacy probably, uh, democracy probably for me would have quite interesting, <laughs> particularly because it seemingly failed. You know, so why did they do it? Because I'm always interested in kind of asking this question, but why did they do it if it was so obviously a failure? You know, why? Because there's got to be a reason. And um, so in a way, this, this method works quite well when it's a failure, because the meaning is, symbolic meaning is actually more important when it fails, uh, because there is no, no kind of acceptable tangible results that have come out, you see. So I'm not saying that one should only use this methodology for <laughs> diplomatic events which seemingly failed, but I think you can gain quite a lot of it, a lot from it. And I also think that there is this thing uh, called diplomatic culture. And maybe somewhere down the line, I might actually kind of work on this, but I'm very interested in trying to understand what makes a sort of international community of people um, able to talk and function with each other. Because we know how difficult it is <laughs> in, in national contexts with all these different you know, representations and class issues, you know, ethnic issues and all that for people to agree on things. But somehow there is some kind of um, uh, community that, that functions uh, more or less smoothly in the international realm. So I'm quite interested in that too. And so I think that it's sort of, um, it comes from that sort of um, asking questions which are not very kind of conventional questions, you know, because I just want to know, I'm kind of interested, almost like an anthropological perspective on, you know, diplomacy. Um, and I think that diplomacy nowadays, um, there's a lot more work being done on these kind of, um, methodologies, I think in the past decade, is picked up quite a lot. And also, uh, we do have um, this issue of um, kind of linguistic problems, because uh, in German historiography, there's been quite a lot of work done uh, before 2000s. And because uh, not many of these have been written or translated into English, it hasn't actually spilled over in the Anglophone world. Um, so I think, you know, there are you know, um, pockets of this research being done in different national contexts, but I think increasingly um, the Anglophone world uh, are kind of, you know, becoming attuned to this um, type of approach, and um, I, I'm sure we'll see more and more interesting works. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to stop. Interrupt, but I just um, so we have about ten minutes left, and if it's okay with the both of you, I would like to give our audience the chance to see if they. Oh, please, okay, please go ahead first. Uh, no, uh, I ideally don't want to uh, get your time uh, from audience, but uh, uh, just just let me say just one thing. So I ideally appreciate uh, this uh, your studies uh, methodology, because you know uh, we like a diplomatic historian only look at policy making process. So uh, this study and this methodology is really eye-opening 
you know, we can open our archive again, you know, to know more about what happened and, and how performance did work. So uh, I think, uh, you know, I was a little bit nervous when I, I was at the podium because uh, this is my first in-person uh, uh, lecture uh, after the COVID, so <laughs> I'm really sorry if I was too too much simplistic uh, to say my comment. So I really appreciate your approach. So, but my what I really wanted to say is that in today's society, um, especially under the COVID, or but even before the COVID, international stage uh, tend to be more boring, right? And that even though they paid attention to uh, say uh, outreach. Uh, to the uh, wider audience, but I really don't think they could succeed. They did succeed in uh, reaching out to the audience, right? Because you know the conference itself is more uh, bureaucratic, and uh, the message they uh, could deliver to the audience is also very simple, sim very simplified. Like China is rising or something, or you know, uh, I mean, the, I think. They really didn't have good agenda, or or even that their performance uh, tend to be more maybe stylish, but you know not good performance. But this is my point. Okay. So.